It's Monday, July 29. Good afternoon. I'm Herman Green with your midday news. If you're watching online at onespotmedia.com, a very special welcome to you. Former Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller has dismissed a claim that she was a recipient of a government issued credit card. Now, Mrs. Simpson Miller sought to clarify the situation in a tweet over the weekend. TVJ's Dashan Hendricks reports. And we will get back to that story in a minute. Now, battle lines have been drawn between both campaigns running for the top job in the People's National Party, PNP. On Sunday night, there was no mincing of words as supporters of Peter Bunting's Rise United campaign launched scathing comments about supporters of the one PNP campaign and its candidate, Dr. Peter Phillips. TVJ's O'Shane Masters tells us more. With less than seven weeks remaining for delegates to decide who will lead them in the next general election, the PNP internal elections is heating up. Member of Parliament for Western Hanover, Ian Hales, last night launched a scathing attack on a number of party officials in the Dr. Peter Phillips campaign at the South St. Andrew Annual Conference. First in his firing line was Lisa Hanna. Mr. Hale says it's shocking that Ms. Hanna has thrown her support behind Dr. Peter Phillips as she was one of the individuals two years ago that was calling for renewal in the party. Next was PNP Vice President Damien Crawford. He recounted a conversation he had with Mr. Crawford before the Portland Eastern by-election, in which he says he advised Mr. Crawford not to run. So you know what, if I don't go, Bunting won't be in here for 15 years. And I won't get my chance to be leader of the People's National Party. Mr. Hale says he again received another call, this time following the appointing of Mikhail Phillips as his campaign manager in the by-election. Shane Masters, TVJ News. Now, political commentator Daniel Archer says, though the presidential race in the PNP has put the party front of mind when the general elections are called, the party will have to come with a renewed machinery to contend with the JLP. She was speaking in an interview with our news center. The fire has been lit. I would say to you that if you want to have that fire that engulfs the population, you need a little bit more than a tubes of kerosene. You get what I'm saying? In other words, you're going to need much more than that. People don't want to see the same old faces. If you want to sell something new, when you market something and you want to sell it to uh, your, your population, the audience, what do you do with it? Do you put on the old time looking bottle? So let's take, for instance, ketchup. Remember the old time ketchup ad and the old bottle? Your same ketchup, you know, but they went and change the shape of the bottle and make it look modern and nice and you're going to say hmm this looks new same ketchup different bottle she says how the party is marketed going forward will determine its ability to be competitive there's lots happening within the jamaica labor party that persons aren't happy with there are questions of corruption there are issues of accountability but are they viable enough to deal with it i think they have to treat with the question that says you are part of the problem the old guard cannot be part of the solution. So they can only become a viable contender if you get an entire new face to the People's National Party, which counteracts the effect of the Jamaica Labour Party. Now, the People's National Party says it's prepared to lead a protest against mining in the cockpit country. PNP President Dr. Peter Phillips said he has had reports of prospectors scouting out areas for mining in places believed to be out of bounds for economic development. These homes have started to use an unconventional and illegal practice to penalize delinquents. Dropped them off at the accident and emergency. 
and we do apologize for the technical issues there. But the cockpit country is one of Jamaica's environmentally sensitive areas. Up to 40% of the country's water resources emanate from the area, and scientists believe it, is al it also contains numerous undiscovered plant and animal life, as well as endemic and endangered species. And we now take a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. We have more stories when we return. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. Now, to a story we had earlier, former Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller has dismissed claims that she was the recipient of a government-issued credit card. We have the details in this report. Last week, Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark, in an interview with Dion Jackson Miller on RGR 94 FM's Beyond the Headlines, outlined that five former PNP ministers and three JLP ministers, including the Prime Minister, received the government approved credit cards before adding. Previous Prime Ministers uh, from the People's National Party have been issued credit cards as well. It raised eyebrows that former Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller may have been a recipient of a government-approved credit card. However, Mrs. Simpson-Miller, in a tweet over the weekend, called the speculation fake news. She said she was offered one but turned it down. Her tweet was made ahead of TVJ News catching up with current PNP president Dr. Peter Phillips, who was the finance minister in the Simpson-Miller administration. Dr. Clark said government issued credit cards would have to be a approved by finance ministers, but Dr. Phillips says he's not recalling approving any. I had no awareness that the policy had been changed in 2009. If the Ministry of Finance approved it in my time, I certainly was not made directly aware and any approvals, I believe, without having the opportunity to refresh myself with the files, would have been really with the financial secretary. But he says he's not placing focus on ministers getting government-approved credit cards. It's a minor issue in relation to what has gone on in the Ministry of Education generally. He maintains, however, that a system of giving per diem for overseas travel is better and brings more accountability. Dashan Hendricks, TVJ News. An illegal practice by nursing homes is now being investigated by the health ministry as it has reportedly been causing havoc in the public health care system. More and more homes have reportedly been dumping their clients in lieu of payment at other facilities. Health and Wellness Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton spoke with us at the opening of a new elevator at the Spanish Town Hospital. How do nursing homes ensure that they are paid for the care and the treatment they provide to their occupants? According to Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton, these homes have started to use an unconventional and illegal practice to penalize delinquent customers. They just pick them up and carry them and drop them off at the accidental emergency and leave them. So their response to non-payment of fees is to have the hospital become the holding area for those persons. That can't be right. He says two nursing homes in Spanish Town are now being investigated because of such cases. So the same nursing home that is transporting and dropping off people here for you to look after them. Then when others come here who really need the service and can't get it because they're in a bed and you have 20 people waiting on a bed, then people hit the social media and start to talk how bad and wicked Spanish Town Hospital is, how wicked the government is that the government not responding. According to the minister, some of the deplorable conditions and long waiting times that other individuals have to endure when they visit the hospitals are caused by these social cases as these individuals occupy spaces and consume resources that could be allocated to other patients. When these social cases occupy a bed, up to 50 persons are denied access within a given year for every one social case for a year in a hospital. And that is what contributes to the long waits for beds Persons who oftentimes come in the media sitting on chairs waiting for a bed. There is someone occupying that bed who takes up that space. He says a few private homes are also being investigated for the same issue. And so the ministry is now taking action to nip the practice in the bud. And so we're going to be pursuing through public education, through moral suasion, but if necessary through the law to deal with some of these issues because we think it's unfair to the hospital and public health and to those who really need the services in the hospital. 
Members of the Greenwich Town Fishing Village are complaining about issues they say they are facing in trying to make a living. The fishing village has been identified for investment from the government before. However, residents say they are still facing challenges. On the way, so we need bigger vessel to go beyond. Yeah, that's we can do with things. That's when I've been paid. These type of people were. We're going to come in the future, so okay. the liquor we left away, we like to hope we can benefit all yeah, it. Yeah. We. Back in 2016, then Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, Carl Samuda, hinted at the government's intention to renovate the fishing village. However, three years later, residents have had to create their own plan in hope that the government will take note of their efforts. We have a development plan, which we have did by one of our friend our architect friends so there's a lot of development plans for the beach such as we have jetties we have mini malls we have basketball ground we have scaling areas infrastructure a lot of things we have on that now member of parliament for southwest st andrew angela brown burke says the likelihood of a plan being successful hinges on residents of the area being knowledgeable about the details Jetty area, we look upgrade, we're looking very good. So we went ahead and we as a fisher folks to sum up some money and we did a development plan all by ourselves. This is Petrodam, right? Hmm? Where they fishing this is Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey, where they fishing beaches? Are you near, sir? I think it might be more further right right down. What I really want, and I like that he has said it, when you have a um, development plan, Everybody in your community needs to know it. So you see, if I stop anybody and ask them what you want, yes. they're supposed to be saying the it's same thing, not true. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. you help put it there, so you have to remember it, and you have to keep it at the forefront, so that all the time you're all talking about the same thing. Yeah? So they're not going to necessarily come to you to ask what is the plan. But anybody, anybody. The Ministry of Tourism has revealed that an audit conducted at the island's hotels and attractions have found some properties in breach of security arrangements. The audit report was completed last month by the tourism product development company TPDCO as part of efforts to ramp up the island's destination assurance program. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett says the report focused on the types of infrastructure available in the industry, such as closed-circuit television system, the structure of windows and doors, among other things in relation to physical security. Mr. Bartlett was speaking at a news conference at the Ministry's New Kingston office this morning. The, the audit reflected um, failings in some areas, and, um, and, and you know, th that was evident. Uh, what it did was perhaps to highlight the category of, um, of properties where the, the highest incidence of breakdown was. And in a funny way, it was not surprising that you know, those that have less capacity and, and less resources would sometimes fall behind in terms of some of these important infrastructure. The security arrangements are part of the licensing requirement for operators within the tourism sector. Many may see getting a school bus as just a simple gesture, but for the Seaward Primary and Junior High School, it's a big deal. Kirk Wright tells you why in this, in this story. On Thursday, the Seaward Primary and Junior High School in San Andrew hosted its first bus drive. Come September, the principal is hoping that the institution will finally have its own bus. Mrs. Marlene Thomas says the well-needed bus will help students of the school to gain experience and exposure, which she believes is critical to the teaching learning process. My chairman, Mr. Bitnell, and myself, we were going to J.B. Stone. And on our way to J.B. Stone, J.B. Stone is when you go to crossroads. And I don't know why our chairman took the route to go up that way, to go to crossroads. You know, we are divinely led in this school. And we took that long route, go up Boulevard and come down to go to crossroads. And he was taking six students with, with him. And as we go along, I was asking them if they knew places and so on. When we got to halfway tree, the students did not know halfway tree. And in a more recent incident. Another trip again. Some of them, you know that they don't know past Coronation Market. They don't. So the teacher took them on a trip. Teachers took them on a trip to the Bank of Jamaica. 
And when they got down there and they saw the buildings, they were so excited. Miss, we reach foreign. That's not a joke. Mrs. Thomas explains that the school tries its best to give the students the exposure by putting on field trips. But most times, it's the teachers who foot the costs because many parents can't afford it. Therefore, having a school bus would make it less challenging for the school. We want our children to go places. We want them to be our center of attention. It's not about us anymore, it's about them. We have been there and we have done that. Kirk Wright, TVJ News. We go down to news in sports. Jamaica's under-23 reggae boys will get their Pan Am Games campaign underway on Monday against Honduras at 5.30 p.m. Jamaica time. The Donovan Duke coach team is hoping to brush off the disappointment of crashing out of the Olympic game qualifiers in the first round of the Caribbean leg. The squad reads Jadine White, Javain Brown, Alex Marshall, Tevin Shaw, Andre Leslie, John Levy, Ajene Tablot, Clifton Woodbine, Ricardo Thomas, Akeem Paris, Deshane Beckford, Lamar Walker, Tyreek McGee, Daniel Green, Shamar Jemison, Leonardo Jebinson, Jordan Fletcher, and Venton Evans. Now, the last time the Jamaican men team played at the Panam Games, they got the silver medal. And that wraps up the Midday News. I'm Herman Green. Please join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of all our teams, good afternoon.